introduction, I'm not as comfortable in front of people as you might think. There's a lot of difference between learning the lines for a script and kind of speaking extemporaneously. So I hope you'll bear with me while I kind of stumble through my story. Uh, 1969, 70, in a place called Decatur, Alabama, was a pretty turbulent time. Uh, in 1969, the last class graduated from Lakeside High School in Decatur. And my, one of my older sisters was actually a member of that class. In 1970, the school uh, was turned into a junior high school. Now, this was an all-black or all-African-American school. And so I attended the eighth grade at this school. Um, but we were informed that this was the last year that the school would be open. So we had to brace ourselves for having to be bused across town to a school that wasn't very inviting or welcoming. And my next oldest sister had told me about her experiences because she was one of the first classes allowed to attend that school. Now, I come from a family of 13 children. Uh, my two oldest brothers were from my father's previous marriage, and they were actually adults when I was born and off to the service. Uh, other than them, I have eight sisters and two other brothers, you know, whole brothers by my biological mom. Seven of those sisters are older. Um, so a lot of the things that I had to prepare for, they were handed down to me from my sisters as far as preparing myself for the world. Uh, my father was a strict Southern Baptist deacon. Uh, he believed in work and more work. So at the age of seven, actually on my seventh birthday, he looked across the dining room table and said, this is the last free meal. You will have your work clothes ready after school tomorrow. And so from then on, I never really had free time after school. I was expected to get my work clothes on and he would either pick me up or I would walk two to three miles across town where we cleaned several churches, white churches, and one office building. This went on for some six years and I had taken an interest in sports, but my father said, if you can't do the work that I have for you and play sports, then the sports are pretty much done. Well, I did play one year of midget football. In the seventh grade, I was the only student in my class that was still small enough to play midget football. And I barely met the weight limit with my pads on. So by the eighth grade, when I realized I would have to be bussed across town and go to school with people who really didn't want to see me, and the fact that more than likely I would not be allowed to participate in extra activities at school, like sports, I was kind of bummed out. So in the spring of 1970, when I came home from school, my mother said, make sure you get your work clothes on. And my work clothes were mainly the type of boots that I still wear today. But my school clothes had to come off and I had to put on some stuff that was kind of patched up. So that day, I really wasn't feeling it. Uh, <laughs> A lot of the guys that I went to school with were going across town to participate in spring practice at that new high school. And I wanted badly to be able to play sports there 
And I know that if I did participate in spring drills, then there was no chance of me playing in the fall. And I just had had enough and I said, I'm not going to work with my father today. My mother said, you know how your father is, you need to get across town. And I said, no. So I actually took a few of my things and I wrapped up some food in some wax paper and I told my mother goodbye because my father had told me that the day that you can't do what I expect of you is the day you leave my house. And I knew that if I didn't report for work with him that day, then I had to find another place to live. And my mother pleaded with me, don't go. And I said, mother, I, I've had enough. I really haven't had a child with other kids get to play ball and hang out with friends on the weekends, but I'm somewhere working. But with that many children and a father with a sixth grade education and that many children, everybody pretty much had to work. So I took off. And needless to say, my father came looking for me. But he would only get sightings of me because I knew all the nooks and crannies of my hometown. Uh, my older sister, who was married, took me in for a few days, but she didn't want to invoke the ire of my father, so she told me it was best that I go back to my folks' place. And I said that there was no way that was going to happen. Now, this was in the spring. I was still in my eighth grade year. I was still attending school. Even if I had to stop at a friend's house, wash up, beg for a change of clothes, but I was not going to miss school because that's one thing I didn't believe in was missing school. And I still had aspirations of going to college. Um, so this, this went on throughout that, the remainder of that semester. I, I never did return home. Uh, the summer months rolled around, which there was a little less stress on me in the summer because I didn't have to get up and figure out how I was going to get to school, how I was going to get a change of clothes, and so on and so forth. So I just kind of flopped at different friends' homes, in parked cars, in the backs of pickup trucks. I would sleep at the bus station, wash up in the restroom. But I was a pretty feisty young man, so. People would say, man, you know, how do you live on the streets like that? I said, well, being on the streets is, is actually more comfortable than living in the home that I came from. Uh, but during the course of that summer, as I was walking through an abandoned house, I inadvertently stepped on a board that had a pretty long, rusty nail in it. And the uh, the nail had actually gone through my foot. Now, I didn't want to go back home still, even though I was in quite a bit of pain and my, my foot was pretty swollen. Well, anyway, word got back to my family and my mom that I was hurt and I was hurt pretty bad. And it was only at this time that she begged my father to notify the authorities that I was on the run. And actually, I wasn't considered on the run because it was just a mutual agreement. If I didn't go by his rules, then there was the door. So I never was called in as a runaway. Well, she convinced him to call the authorities. So they canvassed our neighborhood, and uh, they couldn't find me mainly because I knew every nook, every cranny, every alley. So long before they would get there, I would spot them. I might be in a tree. I might be anywhere. Uh, and so they enlisted the friend, my friends to notify them of where I was located. And they 
stress the fact that I was in grave danger because I could have a serious infection. And if something happened to me and I died from tetanus or lockjaw, as they called it, then they would be to blame. Uh, so my friends lured me out into the open and they said, oh man, you, you really got those guys on the run. They don't know where you are. And I just, you know, laughed it up. Yeah, man, this is my neighborhood. You know, no one's going to catch me in my neighborhood. And about that time, I saw a cruiser a couple blocks away, and I was about to make my mad dash back to my hideaway, and my friends grabbed me. And I said, I can't believe you guys are betraying me let me go. But they didn't let me go, and the authorities nabbed me, cuffed me, and put me in the car. And they took me by my folks' house and said, what, what do you want me to do? And my father said, I don't care where you take him as long as it's away from here. So I was taken to the hospital, examined, given a bunch of shots, and taken and incarcerated. And there I remained for about eight months because it was very difficult at that time to find a place for a young African-American male in Alabama. There weren't boys' ranches, really nice plush places for kids who were what they call status offenders or a person who hasn't really committed a criminal act but they kind of disobeyed the rules of society by not staying at home. Uh, and so they started trying to find a place to put me. And they asked me if I wanted to go into foster care. Well, my friends had told me what foster care was like. Foster care in Alabama for a black kid in 1970 was just basically hard labor. And kids had told me, hey, they feed their kids well, and they almost starve you, but they want you in the cotton fields. I said, Judge, foster care is not for me. And he said, well, I only have two other options. And that's the reformatory and the, or the industrial school in Birmingham. And those were pretty brutal places. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I can't go back to my father's house. But if you send me to one of those places, I will do whatever I, it takes to survive. And you may wind up creating a monster. And they were kind of at a loss for what to do with it. But there was an end, but you can look into it. And so she contacted Boys Town and asked what it took to get a kid admitted to Boys Town. And they sent her this list of requirements and things that had to be done. And so she went down the list and said, and told the judge that I needed to have a physical examination, a dental examination, a psychological evaluation, and some other things, and they had to see my transcripts. Now, mind you, I was still a very good student. And so, she started lining up these types of things for me. And she came out to the detention center where I was lodged and uh, said, uh, William, you know, uh, we're really trying to find a place for you because you're really not a criminal. It's just that you're not comfortable being where you are. And uh, I'm going to look into this place called Boys Town. And I said, you mean like the movie? And she said, yeah, you've seen the movie? I said, who hasn't seen that movie? Man, yeah, I would go there. And she said, well, we don't know for sure whether we can get you in, but we want to give it a try, but you have to kind of stay out of trouble until this happens. And so, process began. I went, I took physical, I went to dental exam, and I went and looked at the ink blocks, and the guy said I wasn't crazy. So, and my grades were very good. And he said, well, they don't know if they really can accept 
the grades from a kid from down there. We don't really trust the educational system, but we'll give you the benefit of the doubt if necessary. So, at any rate, it worked out. All the necessary things were done, and uh, she came back to me a couple of months later. Now, all this time, I'm sitting in a little cell in the place the detention center and tells me, hey, looks like you're in, they've accepted you. And I was really, really stoked. I said, hey, you know, I'm getting out of Alabama. I can probably, I said, they'll probably let me play sports and everything. She said, yeah, you'll get to do whatever kids do. And uh, so they started getting all this stuff together so February 23rd, 1971, the judge and the chief probation officer and myself, because they wanted to see this place, not the lady that helped me get there, but the fat cats took a lot of credit for arranging this, even put a big article in my hometown newspaper, you know, homeless teens set for boys down the road, and yada, yada, yada. You know, and I was the first kid from there to ever get into Boys Town. So we boarded the plane and came to Boys Town, and I went through orientation. And the last thing he said was, don't let me down, because if you show back up in my courtroom, I can't promise you anything. But fast forward, you know, I graduated from Boys Town with honors, came to university, earned a degree, and political science from the university, served in two branches of the military, uh, seen quite a bit of the world. But from time to time with the internet, I would go on there and I would search for this lady's name who had helped me get out of the Cape Alabama. I never could locate her. Even when I went back to Decatur, I would stop by the juvenile court and ask whatever became of her. And no one seemed to ever know where she went. And I'm like, that's, that's pretty odd. You would think colleagues would know where their colleagues go when they leave, but no information on her. And so a lot of years passed. And a few years ago, shortly after, I started working for Lincoln Public Schools. We were at a workshop or kind of a retreat. And uh, one of the exercises was to write a note to someone who made a difference in your life and really impacted the opportunities that you had. And the person that came to my mind first was this, this lady named Marquita Roberts. But I didn't know how to get in touch with her. And so I went back and went through my scrapbooks and all my little souvenirs. And I found one letter that came to me when I was in Boys Town from the juvenile court in Morgan County, Alabama. And I opened this letter and I read through it. And on the side, they had a list of everybody that worked for the juvenile court. And there was this lady's name. Actually, I had been spelling her name wrong all these years. I had never really seen it in writing. And so I went back online and I, I Googled this person's name. And it came up on a Facebook page. But it was a hyphenated last name. But it was the only name that was spelled like that. And so I instant messaged this person and basically asked the question, are, are you, did you ever work for the juvenile court of Morgan County in 1970? And about 15 or 20 minutes later, I, re I received an IM back and it said, yes, I worked there for one year. And if you are who I think you are, I always wondered what happened to you. 
if you were okay and if I made the right decision. And I messaged her back and I said, yes, I am who you think I am. And I really appreciate you helping me out of a really tough time in my life. And uh, we messaged back and forth a few times and, and I just told her that I had a lot of things, I'd had a lot of experiences since she had last seen me and I just wanted to thank her. And it really gave me closure because in the whole excitement of me going through those changes and just trying to get away from that place, I didn't remember ever saying thank you very much for having the heart to look out for me. And so that was my lost person that I found. Thank you.